Dr. Frederick, I want to start in a place that, so most of most conversations about HBCUs start with the question, you know, why do HBCUs still matter? But I want to start with statistics and then we can move into a little bit of a different question. So if you're looking at, at the numbers, around 80% of black judges, 50% of black lawyers and doctors, 25% of black STEM graduates um, come from historically black colleges. So my question is, why do people still question the relevance of HBCUs? Yeah, because unfortunately they probably don't know the data that you just um, pointed out. I think it, the issue is really how excellent can we be? Um, we are an in essential part of the fabric for higher education simply because of the contribution that we make to diversifying many a field uh, based on the data that you have. And so you're right, I don't think the question is why they still exist. Clearly, um, the outcomes uh, from the historically black colleges and universities, I think, speak for themselves. And so what we have to do is to make sure that they are as strong as possible so that they can fulfill and continue to fulfill that role um, as, as strongly as possible. And I'll give you two more data points to further that argument. Uh, the National Science Foundation has a study that looked at uh, the past decade. And the question was really who was producing African-American STEM undergrads who go on to get STEM PhDs. Uh, Howard University was the number one producer. The top 10 schools were HBCUs. That's right. <laughs> and, then, and then when you, um, but if you look at how many Howard produced, we produced 220 in that period of time. Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale produced 221. Uh, the endowment of those four schools, um, I think the market is doing a little better today based on some tweets. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the endowment of those schools is probably about you know, 90 to 100 billion, and Howard's is 750 million. So out punching your weight class, I think, is really the hallmark of our HBCUs. Yeah. And I'm, I want to get back to the, the kind of question of funding in, in just a moment. But um, so you were mentioning kind of it's, it's really about being more excellent. So, so what does it look yeah. like um, for, the, for HBCUs to be more excellent? So the first thing is uh, HBCUs are not a monolithic group, and that's one of the things that I always try to make sure that everyone um, understands, that we're a very heterogeneous group. You have a, an institution like Howard that's fairly complicated, has uh, professional schools like a medical school, a dental school. We have the only dental school in the District of Columbia, the only pharmacy school in the District of Columbia. And then you may have smaller um, colleges and universities that have about 500 students. So the first thing I would say is, recognizing that they're not all one monolithic group. But what's necessary and is for us to really find the areas where we can have the biggest impact and make sure that we do that extremely well. That does require some focused funding in particular areas. But as I mentioned to you before, um, I think we have to think also a bit out of the box. Um, Miles College is a small school in Alabama. Um, does Farsi is one of their strengths, right? Uh, you think of our intelligence um, agencies. I'm not sure how many uh, employees of color we have, and I certainly don't know how many that we have who speak Farsi, but I'm pretty sure that that number could probably be very useful to the intelligence community as an example. So you combine that with cybersecurity education, and I think you have a winner as an example. So finding niche areas where we can participate and probably differentiate I think is going to be key. And then when you get to an institution like the one that I'm running, at Howard University, and you look at uh, the fact that in 1978 there were more African-American males who applied to medical school and in 2014, and Howard University is the number one producer of African-Americans who go on to medical school, then the country has to invest in that, right? In order for us to have better health outcomes, you, you want to have people who are culturally competent taking care of um, for, you know, the, the, the population, and you want disparities to close because really that's where we spend our healthcare dollars. The fact that the maternal mortality rate for African American women is as high as it is, partially is because you don't have as many African American physicians taking care of them, or at least participating in the overall ecosystem of health um, that takes care of them and makes their issues um, a prominent uh, source of concern. So I would say that differentiation is, is key. Um, one of the things that that differentiate, differentiation kind of requires is is the funding to to do it. Um, so I just kind of want to talk a little bit about. Um, so you look at Bennett College and they've raised they raised you know eight million dollars or however much in in um, this course of fifty to sixty days. Um, but over you know over that same month of January you had 
more than a dozen institutions that received $5 million donations um, on their own. So what, um, with kind of this, this interesting legacy and what HBCUs are still producing, what is kind of preventing that, that, that charitable giving aspect of? Yeah, you know, I, I think part of some of it is historical, I, I would say. And, and by that, I would say culturally, if you look at the ecosystem around HBCUs, I would say that our grads give back in other ways, not necessarily financially, but they tend to go back to lower income um, parts of the United States or their home countries, and they tend to give back in spades and service. Again, there's data that you can cite if you look at the graduates from Morehouse School of Medicine, Meharry Medical School, and Howard's Medical School, they're more likely to serve in underserved areas. So they do give back in that sense. It also means that their income levels are going to be less as a result. Clearly, there's um, still significant income inequality and discrimination in terms of what African-American women may get paid for the same job that a white male may get paid for. And so we still have significant income inequalities. And when you look at the unemployment rate, it's still almost twice that for African-Americans than it is for the rest of the population. So all of those things mean that the actual amount of dollars that they can give back themselves is, is a bit suppressed. And then when you look at mega donors um, who give, we still have a culture in this country of, we, we say that it's giving to people who want to be associated with success, but really what we're doing is really making the bigger, that much bigger without really getting a return on investment in terms of what the broader constructs. So we have to make an argument, we as in the HBCUs, I think have to make an argument to the broader society as to why we are important and f to allow people to see that the fact that they may not have attended an HBCU or that they may not um, be somebody who's African American or come from a circumstance in which they have not had all the opportunities, why it's important for these institutions to um, be strong and to, and, to, and to thrive because ultimately they will benefit. And I think that that's where we have to make the argument. So whether it's you know, corporate donations or foundation donations or just you know, uber wealthy um, donors, we have to be in that sphere, we have to participate. And I think that that's more and more you're seeing that the HBCU presidents and boards are recognizing that and are either adding those types of individuals to their boards or engaging more with corporations. I just hired someone a few months ago to be a senior VP for corporate relations, as an example. It's not an, a position we've ever had um, at the university, and that's an example of, of the types of things that we have to do, and hopefully there'll be a return on investment on that type of investment soon enough. Yeah. Um, so Senator Elizabeth Warren has proposed a $50 billion um, kind of fund for HBCUs and other MSIs. Um, do you think that it's, you, you talked a, a bit about historical, um, that kind of historical underfunding of the institutions and, and um, that, that legacy. Do you think it's a federal and, and state kind of responsibility to um, kind of address that, that historical? Yeah. You know, I, I have to admit, I, I wouldn't, you, I'm not, usually of the proclivity to suggest that you know you need the federal and state support especially for non for p private institutions in this circumstance though i i do think it is a responsibility because the diversity of what the 102 hbcus is providing i think is so strong that the federal government and the state governments um, have an interest in seeing them thrive i mean if you the issue around black docs is an example. You look at dentists. 40% uh, of the black dentists in this country are produced by two schools in this country, Howard and Meharry. So as far as I'm concerned, I think the federal government does and should take an interest in making sure that those schools thrive so that we can um, certainly boost that. Um, I, the other reason is because there's an out, you have an outsized burden that you're putting on these institutions. I'm a surgeon, I trained at Howard. Um, Howard has probably produced more African-American women surgeons than any other institution in this country. And over the course of, since 1970, we've probably produced about 50 something to 60 of, the, of those young women. Now, you think about it in a country of 300 million, for one institution to do that, and that's the largest number for any one institution, that's a problem. What happens if Howard goes away? Right? All of a sudden, we take a crisis and we turn it into extinction in terms of seeing some of those types of faces in certain fields. So I would argue that I think the federal government and state governments 
do have uh, a responsibility to do that. And then when you put it in context of where that funding is now, let's, let's look at that context. We have the largest um, endowment at Howard of all the HBCUs at 750 million, right? Um, the institutions that we are competing with for students are in the Ivy League, right? And you've got Ivy League schools now with um, endowment between 20 billion and uh, 40 billion. If they take 5%, of their endowment and put it into the operating expense, which is kind of what most of our endowments do, um, they will be spinning off, in some circumstances, $2 billion. Mm -hmm. You spin off $2 billion, you run my institution on $750 million mm -hmm. with a revenue, operating revenue. You add, you double my endowment with another $750 million, and the other 500 is gravy. You probably build five buildings, <laughs> right? So, so that, that's just to put it in context for you in terms of what just spinning off 5% of their endowment in one year would do to Howard, and Howard is at this extreme in terms of the financial resources of all the HBCUs. So, so the, the, this is not even an income inequality gap. Mm. It, it, it's a, I think it's a danger to the national interest to not invest in these institutions. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of this town-gown relationship. Um, Howard's in an interesting position, um, whereas uh, you know, DC sort of gentrifies, um, you still have this kind of historic kind of legacy institution there. Um, how do you manage those, those rela that relationship um, as, as the area around Howard gentrifies? Yeah, so I have a confession. I mean, I came here as a 16-year-old to DC, uh, lived in Northeast, took the bus to Howard um, with DC residents who were going to the high schools across the street from Howard. Um, such as Banneker, so I really feel like I'm a DC native with a southern draw, very <laughs> southern draw. <laughs> and so I, I, I feel, I, I think it's very important for us to preserve, not just preserve the legacy for the sake of preserving it, but I think if you meet someone from DC who grew up here as third generation, et cetera, there's so, something so soulful about that person, so unique, that adds so much character and energy to the city, that I think to lose that, um, carelessly, especially, is, is just unforgivable. So I feel very strongly that we have to look at how these things work, how they interlock, and, and to make sure that we do this in a balanced fashion so that we get the, the type of environments that we want. So I think there are a couple of things that I try to do. When I became president, I had a meeting with the ANC commissioners and um, the faculty, students, and staff of Howard in the boardroom mm -hmm of the university, and I did that every month. And the reason for doing that was to make sure that everyone was educated about why this 100, and at that time we were almost 150 years old, why this institution was there in the first place. Because I think sometimes in our society, we just assume that people are gonna move into the city, move into this neighborhood, see this university there, and just assume great things. And unfortunately, that's not the society we live in, because most of those people will move, take the train, and never even walk on that campus or pick up the news and really look and f figure out that this place has produced more black physicians than any other place in the country and all of those other types of things. So I think you have to really have interaction. I think that's one. The second thing is I think we need to look at some of this gentrification differently. I've recently been in a discussion with the city about potentially moving Howard's Hospital to St. Hugh's campus and building out our health sciences complex with the four health sciences schools, um, nursing and allied health, pharmacy, medicine and dentistry around there. I think that's a different kind of gentrification. You put 1,100 to 1,200 young African-Americans in that place, well-educated, um, who could interact. You could create jobs for the people in that neighborhood. You have 170,000 citizens. You have no acute care hospital where a woman can deliver a baby. You have two grocery stores. Um, I think we could, we could create a different type of gentrification. We talk about gentrification, but the subplot there is a racial issue. And we unfortunately leave that elephant in the room and talk around it by putting the words gentrification around that elephant. And in truth and in fact, I think what we need to look at is how do we empower people in that neighborhood so that they can raise their income levels and raise their quality of life, et cetera. Oftentimes, what we're doing is we, we, we drop the elephant in and displace everything out, and I think there's a different way to approach it, and so that's one of my hopes that we could approach it differently. Yeah. So we're gonna to go to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, 
The first question, as the number one HBCU in the country, I went to Alabama A&M University in Huntsville. So it's a pretty good one as well. So uh, I wonder if your plan for the future includes expanding financial aid to cover the cost of more Pell-eligible FGLI students. So I think this is a very um, interesting perspective. So we are a private institution. 60% of my undergrad students are Pell Grant eligible. Right? So to put that in context, um, the average student who's coming to Howard, their parents make less than 40 something thousand dollars. And of those Pell Grant eligible students, 50% have an EFC, an expected family contribution of zero. So this is a major issue for us. And our discount rate right now is about 45%. So we charge about 27,000 in tuition and we're discounting about 45% off the bat. Last year we gave $110 million in, um, in institutional aid. So what we do in terms of already giving to students to afford them the opportunity to come is, is huge. Ultimately, I would like for Howard to fully fund all Pell Grant students completely because we've demonstrated that we can get those students through and graduated just as well as we do the students who don't qualify for Pell Grants. As a matter of fact, the difference in my Pell Grant graduation rate and my non-Pell graduation rate is 1%. Hmm. And so we're very proud of that, but we can do even more with the right types of resources. And you have to remember, we're taking those students from the bottom 20% in income level, and we often are shooting them up into the top 10% income being a, a marker of their ability to navigate and get up the economic escalator. And so definitely I would love to fund it, but again, you know, we need those types of donations that would underwrite that discount rate that I was referring to. Yeah. Do you think HBCUs have a special role in countering displacement of local residents through gentrification, selling off property to developers to build condos? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, we've done quite a few real estate deals, and I want to make it clear that I have not sold any property because I feel very strongly about that. What we've done is we've, we own all the land, and I have done long-term lease deals and allow the developers to develop on the land. So we ultimately own, uh, are still property owners. You know, I think it's a challenge because either you get that revenue in from tuition, you get it from big donors, or you get it from other assets. And what we've tried to do is to use some of that to put it back into um, our institution. So for instance, our undergrad library is being renovated and is being renovated because of dollars that, has co that have come in because of those real estate deals, in which I want to emphasize again, we still own the land. Yeah. Um, I actually have a subsequent question that's following up on, on something you said a little bit earlier about um, black, black doctors and physicians. Um, so, uh, you know, Texas Tech recently um, stopped considering race and admissions um, yeah. due to an agreement with, with the Justice Department. Do you think that, how, what do you think the role that affirmative action should play in, in um, medical school should be? Yeah, you know, I, I not only went to Howard and did general surgery residency at Howard, but I did my fellowship at MD Anderson. And when I was there at MD Anderson, I was the only black person in the surgery department of about 40 something people. I went back last week as the distinguished alum in, for 2019. And I mentioned that because if, if we don't look at providing those opportunities through some mechanism, whether it's affirmative action or us actually creating pipeline opportunities, there, there will be a dearth of opportunity and a dearth of outcomes that show, uh, have a diverse society representation in all of these different fields. And I think that that's more dangerous than the concerns that people may have over affirmative action. And the numbers just don't suggest that, right? If, if in 1978 you had more African-American males enter medical school than in 2014, we have a problem. And if we don't address the problem all the way from K through 12, all the way to our undergrad and, and our medical school, then it's going to exist. We have a middle school on our campus focused on math and science. And I think if you stop any of those students right now and you ask them where they go to school, they'll tell you I go to Howard University. <laughs> they won't say Howard University Middle School, but all of those things mean that they're beginning to assimilate with the thought of getting there. But we had to create that opportunity, right? And how many other people are doing it? We don't have all the resources to educate every black doctor in, in the country. So if others don't do it and give these kids an opportunity, then we're not gonna get there. Yeah. I'm gonna take one more uh, question from the audience quickly. How do you feel about people from the communities coming to walk their pets on the campus? <laughs> I, I, I thought we had gotten past this question. <laughs> In all seriousness, I'll say this. Um, 
on the same day that I put out a statement about this, which was a Friday, uh, I think probably Good Friday to be exact, three young black men were shot in D.C. They were brought to Howard Hospital and one of them died. And so, again, as a society, I think we have to prioritize what's important. And the loss of an African-American male um, should be memorialized by the pen of the Howard University president rather than a dog being walked on my campus. And I say that because it was a heartbreaking moment for me. I'm the father of a 14-year-old son. And to go home and think that the most important thing that anybody read about what I had to say on that Friday was about a uh, dog being walked on my campus and not about this young man who died in our streets and his two, two other you know, friends who were in my hospital with gunshot wounds. And so I, I, think we, I think as a society, we have to prioritize and we have to make sure that that's what we're about. And as Howard president and the father of a 14-year-old African-American male, that's way more important to me than anything that's going to happen around somebody walking a dog on my campus. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a great conversation.